Welcome. This week's show is sponsored by the Embroiderers Guild of America and Sassy Jack Stitchery. A new uh, thing you want to note at the Embroiderers Guild of America is the 22nd Through the Needle's Eye exhibit. This will be displayed virtually at the 2023 National Seminar in Boston and then as a three-month live display in Louisville, then on the EGA website. It'll include member original and adaptation needlework, and the theme is Celebrate the Diversity in Embroidery. Now, this is the 2023 National Seminar, but uh, you need to note that the first step is to get registered, and that registration is open now through December 31. Quite a lead time on this. So get registered now if you want to participate, and all the details are in the events section of the EGA website. And then a new class that is being offered is Lazy Summer Day, taught by Judy Borison Caruso, and registration is open now through August 4. And of course, encourage you to visit the EGAUSA.org website, lots of free things for non-members. Uh, The gallery is a treat to go through, and on top of all of it, join EGA. You won't regret it. Uh, So much to offer on so many fronts for needleworkers, and uh, worth worth every every penny. So join them, uh, egausa.org. Our other sponsor, Sassy Jack Stitchery, and uh, Kim at Sassy Jack's. uh, Kim and company getting ready to move into their new uh, storefront, the Baird House, in early fall. So we look forward to that. And then, of course, we have projects that we're doing with uh, with Kim and Sassy Jacks, the Marion Lang sampler, the Mary Jane Fry 1861 sampler, the Botany Bay sampler, and the Take Wing sampler. Uh, all of those kits available at the Sassy Jacks website. And now here's an additional word from Kim. Sassy Jack Stitchery is happy to be a sponsor of Fiber Talk. We so appreciate all the heart that Gary and team put into their show, and we always look forward to each episode. Thank you, Fiber Talk, for all you do for our needlework world. Sassy Jacks is a vibrant needlework shop located in the mountains of western North Carolina, just north of Asheville. We're in the process of moving our shop to its forever home in a historic folk Victorian on the national listing of historic places just three miles down the road from our current location. While we're moving, you can find us in all our normal online haunts, our website at sassyjackstitchery.com, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We can't wait to open our doors and welcome you into our new old home. It was always the plan to be in this beautiful old house, and we've invested a huge chunk of our hearts into its renovation. Every renovated board, every push-button light switch, every old porch swing has lovingly, mostly, (laughs) been placed there with our own hands. It has a wonderful, warm, welcoming feel about the place already, and your stitchy joy and laughter with friends will really make it home for Sassy Jacks. So look for us online for the next few months, as we'll be filling online and phone orders as per usual, and we'll be looking forward to the spring at the Baird House in Asheville, North Carolina. When the time comes, we'll leave the light on for you, just like your mom did when you were a kid, so you'll know it's time to come home. Now on to the show. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, Melinda Sherbring. Melinda, welcome. Happy to be here. All right. Now, we we have so many facets of you. This could be a four-hour show, I'm thinking. Yes. (laughs) Too many things. So, So we were talking before we started recording, and... Uh, 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 because your uh, computer science, uh, NASA worked on the Hubble telescope, uh, electrical engineer, all of those things, and uh, we're not going to we're going to go through all of that. But it fascinates me someone who operates at that intellectual level. And then, what is it about needlework and your uh, Society for Creative Anachronism and your uh, uh, teaching and design work. What is it about that? Is is that all release? Is it hobby sep- separate from? I mean, there's there's got to be a an outing for a mental outing when you operate 
uh, in the science world? Well, as a uh, systems engineer and software engineer, um, I have to be very precise. And with the, uh, I, I was a scribe long before I was a needleworker. And so these things are things that kind of get you out of the, it has to be this way and only this way. Ah. And it gets you into the, the flow kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's what you need. <laughs> now, does it, when, when you do that, then is the other half of your brain, I assume, is still working on the problems of the day? Oh, probably. Yeah. Because sometimes uh, ideas pop up and you go, oh, where'd that come from? Yeah. Yeah. So then, okay, so then you know, th that established then when you retire. I retired in 2013 from aerospace. Uh -huh. So now you got yeah. a whole half a mind that's free. <laughs> 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 no, I find that I approach writing needlework instructions very similar to the way that I approached writing software usage instructions. Ah, okay. So it's still there. It's still there. And <laughs> I find that people who are engineers or former engineers, and I know a fair number of women who are, um, they find those instructions very comforting because it talks about exactly what you do. Ah, uh-huh. Right. So, and I was going to ask, so does, I know you write articles too. So, yes. So do you find that also fulfills that other half need? Well, this morning, for instance, I was trying to uh, get ready for this and I'm going, okay, what do I do? What do I do? And I said, okay, calm down. Let's <laughs> open up a document that I'm currently working on uh, about a, uh, coif that I saw uh, several years ago and let's fix these three paragraphs and so I looked over them and said ah, yeah uh, they could be better uh, yeah and you know an hour later I'd finished those three paragraphs fixing and I was a lot calmer and I said okay now we can go back to does every <laughs> is everything ready <laughs> yes Okay, so see, I see so that's what's interesting to me is that mental process when, when you have creative people is is there's how how the yin and yang kind of thing how it works because you you have to have the structure, but then you got to have the art and so how do those play off of each other and so the the structure settles you down where for a lot of people the art settles them down. Well, the art is settling too. Okay. I mean, um, when I was in high school, I was sure that I was going to grow up and be an author and write science fiction. You'll notice that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and in fact, when I went to college, I thought, okay, so I should take English. And, and the first day while we're trying to decide what to take, I'm going, okay, so if I take all these really cool English classes, Oh, then what am I qualified for? To be a secretary. That is a fine profession, but one not for me. Mm -hmm. So I looked at my, you know, Lance or whatever uh, SAT scores, SAT scores, and said, math. Math is just a language. Let's go major in math. <laughs> and so that's kind of how I got onto the scientific track. It was purely on a what will I do with an English degree question. Okay. <laughs> and then my sister is the real artist in the family. She's had actual art degree and, and, and so on. So, so uh, I was the scientist, she was the artist, and my brother's the mechanical engineer. <laughs> now, now, now nice there's, balance. Yeah, there's a Thanksgiving table discussion right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Holy smokes. Yeah. But, but still some creativity in you, obviously. Oh, I've been drawing and sketching and writing uh, since I I poked my nose in a book and discovered that you could actually write them yourself. And art is kind of the same way, is you see it, you can write it down. And uh, my sister was a genius at, at uh, drawing dragons and unicorns and things. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I learned from her, and she's younger than I am. Yeah, okay. 
Now, we mentioned in a recent show, actually, uh, this will be, yeah, uh, this is Sunday, so it was the, the Wednesday show uh, was talking about that we were going to talk to you and the Society for Creative Anachronism, which was completely new to me, never heard of such a thing. And uh, Beth knew of people, and then several yeah. people in the audience knew. Talk, mm-hmm. talk about that. How does that come about? What is that? What does that do? Because I'm, I'm most fascinated. Well, the Society for Creative Anachronism started in the 1960s in Berkeley, Um, and it was basically a protest against the 20th century. And uh, they started with a tournament. The first people there were uh, had been fencers, and so they had a, a tournament, and they had lords and ladies and all sorts of fun things, and um what was supposed to be a one-off party kind of said, well, gee, this is fun. Let's do that again. And let's do that again. And pretty soon (laughs) they were saying, well, if we're going to meet in a park, we need a name. And Marion Zimmer Bradley uh, came up with the name society for creative anachronism. And that's kind of how it started in the late 1960s. I heard about it in 1972 at a world science fiction convention in Los Angeles. And I said, oh, this is fun. This looks like a real, oh, and you get to wear cool dresses. I've never been a big fan of wearing dresses. I like pants myself. <laughs> but mm-hmm. long to the floor dresses and you look so elegant. And wh- Oh, and they fight. I was a fencer too. <laughs> <laughs> And they fight. <laughs> Good. And they do. They do fight. It's fun to watch. But go it ahead. Is. Sorry. And it's fun to do. Um, so as a fencer, um, I said, well, this is kind of cool. This is sword and shield, not little skinny foils. And you're wearing real armor. Well, how do you get the real armor? I discovered that there were uh, – I found this when I was in, in school, in grad school. And so I went back home to Las Cruces, New Mexico at that time and found that there was a chapter near me and they had a fighting practice. Oh, cool. So uh, I got my whole fencing uh, club to join, all both of us. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Two? (laughs) Yeah, you need two to fence. What can I say? Right, right. And uh, I was president and my boyfriend was vice president, and then the next semester he'd be president and I'd be vice president. That's tight. You know? That's really tight. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, we found a few people, but but mostly uh, we were kind of languishing, saying there's no one else to fight here. Um, but with uh, the SCA group, we go, oh. And so I'd borrow armor and get out there on the field and, and be whacked and die and get up and be whacked again and die and <laughs> it became kind of normal um <laughs> but uh uh then when i got a job in 1975 out here in los angeles i had a referral to someone who was in the sca uh katherine kurtz who's also a uh science fiction author and so i contacted her and said you know, is there SCA out here? And she said, why, yes, there is. Come to X place at X time and and join us. And I've been active in the Southern California uh, version of the Society for Creative Anachronism ever since. Um, I started as a fighter, but then decided that you can get hurt. And I didn't own a helmet. So I had to keep borrowing a helmet. And so I decided, well, maybe the fighting was more for watching than for doing. But there's all these other cool crafts that people are doing. And so uh, at that point, I was uh, more interested in calligraphy and illumination and uh, uh, heraldry. So I would go to the monthly heraldry meetings, and I uh, was working with the... uh, scribes and so on and and learning about oh i discovered that insular manuscripts of the first century a.d in britain were my love i uh, 
adore them. And then I met uh, a uh, person who was a relative of another person. You know how things go. <laughs> uh, who taught uh, the dots method of making Celtic knotwork. Oh, eyes open, scream of joy. This was wonderful. Um, I'm the sort of person that finds a rabbit hole, jumps down it, <laughs> takes notes on the way. If I've reached the end and still am interested, I'll take those notes and write them up into an article. And then I'll run it by friends and say, did I lo miss anything? What, what am I missing here? <clears throat> Because people who review your work and just say it's wonderful are very nice and you say thank you. But yeah. people who review your work and say, I really was curious about X or you introduced this but didn't tell me why you thought that. Those are the persons that you go, yes, <laughs> read my next article. <laughs> <laughs> now, because now, as as part of this society, you – you actually create and, and, and in the activities become another person. Yes, yes. One comes up with a persona. Uh, my persona is named Eowyn Amberdrake. Eowyn, because I was a great fan of Lord of the Rings, and you'll notice that she was a fighter too. <laughs> mm. yeah. And so um, I said, Eowyn, it's Anglo-Saxon, uh, Eo. Deutero, Deutero theme meaning horse and wind meaning joy. Um, and Tolkien knew his Anglo-Saxon, so it must be a name. Right, right, okay. Um, then I said Amber Drake. Well, I like Golden Dragons, but Golden Dragon is just too easy yeah. and too odd and too kind of Chinese sounding, and it didn't sound Anglo-Saxon. So I thought, well, a synonym for golden might be amber colored and a dragon could be a drake so that became amber drake it's there we go yeah well there but see the, the the creativity is carrying through here because so now uh, you can take this i'm sure these personas as far as you want but uh, oh yes do, do we create an entire wardrobe and a different look for yourself how how far did you take it well um, the SCA is uh, has an official end cutoff date of 1600, and no official beginning cutoff date. So there's Romans, there's um, you know ancient Greeks and so on that show up at events. Um, <clears throat> but I decided since I'd come up with the name Eowyn, I must be Anglo-Saxon. That put me in oh about 650 A.D. That's a good number because. <laughs> Um, it's before Lindisfarne was sacked. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I figured, okay, that also put me in, in good stead for, for doing all this fun stuff with Celtic illumination, except it isn't just Celtic, it's insular because the Anglo-Saxons did it too. And, uh, so I, I came up with Eowyn Amber Drake as, as a seventh century scribe. And I chose 650 because that's exactly, uh, yeah, I was born in 1950, so 650, it was easy to figure out what age I was. There we <laughs> and go. What year I, and what year <laughs> it was for me. Um, and then I got interested in heraldry. Well, heraldry isn't really Anglo-Saxon. It's more, oh, 12th, 13th, 14th century. So I've got it 13th, 14th century Eowyn Amber Drake, who's obviously a distant descendant of the original one. <laughs> and uh, that's where I did most of the later period scrolls and uh, uh, heraldry and so on. And, and then in the mid 90s, I discovered, well, no, in the late 1980s, sorry, um, when I went to England, I discovered Elizabethan stuff and said, okay, I'm a scri I, I'm I'm going to be Elizabethan too, oh. and so those are my three periods of most emphasis, and so my costumes are any of the above. Okay, and and you make your own costumes. Um, these days you can actually buy them. Yeah. Uh, off the rack from Renaissance fair people. Okay. Um, 
But at the time, no. I mean, my very first costume was based on a Bellerophon coloring book. Um, uh, hey, it was right. based it worked. On, a, on, a, on a painting, and it uh -huh. was Elizabethan. And I didn't know about what all the underwear needed to be and so on. <laughs> so it was a good faith attempt. <laughs> So, yeah, the but, undergarments are kind of a kind of a whole mechanism of themselves, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. You need a hoop skirt to hold it out. You need a corset or a kirtle to hold yourself in. You need, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what makes it fun because you have all this other stuff that we don't normally wear right. um, anymore. Thank goodness, but you know. Right, and and a friend of mine had had uh, an SCA wedding in the early 80s and she wanted it to be uh, Elizabethan so for six months beforehand we met every month and we all worked on our clothing and that was a much better Elizabethan <laughs> yeah. now, all right, so then somewhere along here comes needlework well um, I was aware of it but not really much until I became a member of the National Board of Directors of the SCA in 1984, and I was on that till 1988. And a couple years in, I'm sitting in the committee of the whole meeting that it takes an entire day before the real meeting. And <laughs> oh, I'm going, oh. I got to do something with my hands. I've got to do something. And so a friend of mine who is an avid cross stitcher said, here, Here's some here's some some instruction on on counted cross stitch. Oh, okay. So I would sit there during the committee meetings and stitch. And this is not an unusual thing to happen in SCA meetings because um, everyone is assumed to do crafts. And if you're in a meeting, you can certainly keep doing your craft if it doesn't require loud noises or uh, total attention and the nice thing about needlework is, is once you get into the rhythm of it, it's almost meditative. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, so that's, that's your, that's your start in the middle of a meeting. Here's some instructions sorted out during the meeting. Right. Hey. <laughs> uh, and then uh, in 1991 or two, I don't remember which, um, a friend at work said, uh, you do embroidery, right? Uh, yeah, we're uh, creating a, uh, a new chapter of EGA close by. It'll meet every uh, first of every month in the evening so you can go because most of the chapters met during the day and us working girls couldn't go. So uh, I joined the chapter as it was starting and that opened up a whole new world <laughs> beyond counted cross stitch. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, that's it. It's, I remember when I joined, there was like all of a sudden it's not just doing counted cross stitch. It's all the other things, the needlepoint and. Oh, yeah. And and I thought I'm firmly a, a counted stitch person. And then in 1996, I think it was, I went to National Seminar in San Francisco and took a class in Elizabethan embroidery. Mm. I was gone. It was it, it 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 spoke to me. It said, "Hi, this is what you're meant to do." <laughs> oh. and so I kept doing it. Now, so so that's uh, okay. So Elizabethan. So now now we're we're from cross stitch to surface embroidery and uh, a much freer form of of design. Then, yeah, yeah. Um. And uh, somewhere in there, it's kind of an adjunct to the Society for Creative Anachronism. Um, in 1988, a friend of mine organized a costume tour of England to celebrate the defeat of the Spanish Armada. We had to all learn a British accent and uh, <laughs> have several costumes. And we were all in Elizabethans, and we sang and danced and... and uh, this was part of the beginnings of uh, interpretation uh, by historical reenactors at venues. So we were at Cum Sydenham and um, 
uh, Wingfield uh, College and uh, various places that I can't even remember, Holdenby House, um, and were uh, inhabiting it for a weekend or, two or so. And tourists came in and, and uh, you know, were, were agog at people in garb. And, <laughs> uh, wow. Because this was before it became common. Uh, at, the, at the end of the tour, the rest of us went home and our organizer uh, presented a paper at a conference about this oh. concept. Uh -huh. And so we were, we were among early adopters, shall we say. Yeah. And, and then now, so as you get involved in the needlework, then you stay pretty true to the, uh, uh, to the ancient world of needlework. I mean, that's, you've done an awful lot of, of study of old stitches and, and, um, a lot of your designs have a very old feel to them. Well, in a, po in a yeah. positive way. Don't, don't get me wrong. In a positive way. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, and 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 I agree, because um, as I got into it, I discovered that okay, for instance, black work. If you take a black work class these days, they will talk about thread thickness and um, design density and um, how to shade within a motif using. Uh, uh, patterns uh, of black work and so on. And I wasn't seeing any of that in the historical black work. And I'd seen a fair amount by this time. And mostly in books, but a little bit in person. And I'm going, okay, so historical black work would have, for instance, a petal of one pattern, and maybe the next petal would be a different pattern, or maybe it would be the same pattern. But they didn't shade from paler to oh. darker within oh. the petal. Um, and all of my black work teachers, because I took black work from some very um, excellent EGA and ANG, uh, American Needlepoint Guild, uh, teachers. Uh, Marian Scholar, I love taking her class, but she's teaching me all this modern stuff. And I'm going, oh, so there's modern black work and there's 16th century black work. And in fact, 16th century black work, well, in the SCA, mostly people were using black work uh, as the name of the stitches that go around uh, your, the ruffles or the cuffs or things like that. So basically linear things, not filled things. Oh, there's lots of, oh, and some of them are filled with patterns, and some of them are filled with spots, just mm. little tiny dots, like like they're trying to imitate um, a woodcut. Um, <laughs> hmm. Mm. And so the more I kept looking at historical stuff, particularly in books at this time in the mid-90s, um, but the more I saw that there were a lot of different kinds of black work and that there was modern kinds. And so I, I certainly appreciate modern black work as well. But I want to make sure that people are aware that there are lots of different things that come under the name black work. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so now you've opened my eyes because my... I mean, I know enough about black work to be dangerous, <laughs> and you know, and and so my assumption was that when we see these sophisticated black work designs with uh, different thread thicknesses and shading and uh, you know, all the beautiful things you see, that that was the the pinnacle of ancient black work, but quite the opposite. No, no, it was it was very different. Um, hmm. They would have, say, a pansy, and the two top. Uh, petals would be one pattern and the three bottom petals would be a different pattern. But, and one of the patterns might be visually more dense than another, but um, there would not be any shading in it. Mm. If you wanted shading, what you were probably going to do is use uh, dots because the dots part, they had some that were, um, seeding that is uh just 
uh, a running stitch going down and then a running stitch coming back um, parallel to it and so on. So you've got a lot of little seeds, as it were. Um, but there were also uh, ones that used uh, a black and a white thread in the same needle, twisted, and then you would do long and short stitch. And it gives you the effect of dots. And if you did long and short stitch just on the edges, which they sometimes did, and often did actually when they're using this technique, you would have a large blank area and then you would have a, a speckled or heathered area. And then they might have put uh, long and short stitch in just black uh, at the very edge so that you have a gradation of, of shades but it wasn't because they changed anything in a pattern. It was because they were using long and short stitch and they were using two threads and you go, whoa, <laughs> that's well, that is interesting. Yeah. Fascinating. Cause I've done some black work, but not a lot enough to be dangerous. <laughs> and I, I was never taught that again from modern, right. from modern perspective. Right. Oh, the, the, the modern stuff seems to date from about the very early 1900s. Oh, my. Hmm. And, and there's some really cool stuff being done. Yeah. Um, and well, see, I, the, I, the techniques you just described, though, see, to me, you know, that's, that's another open door in terms of how to approach needlework. It seems, it seems like yep. every time that, that we talk about these kinds of things, we, we discover that there's another way that there, you know, it's, you know, there's not this yeah. prescribed way that you must do everything. There's another way to achieve a look uh, that someone else has tried and had success with. That's interesting. Yeah. I think some of the, the styles of black work in the 1600s uh, and 1500s were imitating uh, printing. Uh-huh. Uh, so, Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. Right, because you couldn't, they didn't know how to print, correct? I mean, to print on fabric was difficult to do, correct? Right. And some of them actually seem to have done that. But if you open up a, a book that has a woodcut in it of a flower, it, that woodcut will probably be shaded with uh, uh, straight lines. And so just straight lines is a style of black work hmm. Hmm. that go through part of them. In fact, I started collecting instances and um, I have something I call black work anthology. I started it in about 1996 or so, 97. And it's little pieces of uh, designs from historical pieces and from modern pieces that have different styles of things that have been called black work. And I'm up to like 12, 15, something like that, different styles. Hmm. So, and, and I may I ask what you're going to do with this information if you're going to publish it so all of us can enjoy this. Uh, eventually, somehow, I'm trying to figure out how because mm -hmm. um, I've got, uh, the ones that I finished by the early 2000s, I hand put it into hand bound it into a book with um, uh, a, uh, a pay. It's called a black work anthology because anthology is a collection of flowers. And so all of these are flowers. Um, and the idea is each one is a page and then it is followed by a page that says this is where the design comes from and what we know about uh, it, you know, whether it was uh, done with uh, silk thread, flat silk or whatever. And uh, then how I re did the, re the reproduction as close as possible to the real thing. But uh, when I was working in the 1990s, I didn't know how to do plaited braid. So I had to choose something else because I didn't know plaited braid. Um, and they were doing it, and I couldn't figure it out from Mrs. Christie's descriptions in her <laughs> samplers and stitches from the 1900s. It just wasn't working for me. Uh, and no one was teaching it. No one was. I, I took the Tudor class 
1996 uh, at the seminar because I was hoping I'd learn plaited braid. And I didn't. I learned many other things that I am delighted to know, but I did <laughs> not learn plaited braid. Now, what carries you to Master Craftsman? Well, in uh, EGA, there is a program called Master Craftsman. It's six steps. Uh, first step is counted cross stitch, and I thought, I got that one nailed. Um, second one did you? was a uh, yeah, I, okay. I got, I, I, I did. I, I, or, I, or did you I get surprised? Number four. <laughs> I've finished through number four, but the fifth step, I haven't, I've, I designed my own stuff for each step because that's, I'd rather do my stuff than, than someone else's. Um, and it, uh, uh, so I did the, the counted cross stitch and I did the ACC uh, based on a, a uh, design as if it were a, it reminded me of white vine, uh, or no, actually Romanesque. White vine is the Renaissance. Romanesque is the 1200s uh, version where you've got uh, manuscripts that have decorated initial letters with uh, colors behind and a white vine in front. And so I chose to draw a dragon in the form of an S and uh, put some scribes in the background uh, kind of looking back and forth at each other going, huh, how come the dragon's bigger than us? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and so that was my design for the ACC. And then uh, for black work, I did a couple of, uh, in the uh, 1988 trip, I took some pictures of members of our troop dancing. So I took those, photos and turned them into uh, black work patterns. Um, and then let's see what next was white work. And for that, I used Pictish crosses. I like the idea of using stone carved symbols reproduced in lace. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> A little juxt juxtaposition there. Yeah, I mean. Uh, okay, a, a, a question. Do you do, ever do anything normal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do take classes, and sometimes I even finish them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so the the white work, and then is that where you're at now? Uh, well, I'm. I finished the white work, and the next step is, is uh, uh, hardanger, and I haven't gotten inspired properly for hardanger, and so. It's been 10 years since I've oh my. the last one. And so I'll have to rejoin the program if I want to finish it. Uh, but Hardanger, and then the last one is combining any three or uh, four, four of those. And I'm going, okay, that part's easy. It's the, well, I came up with a really cool idea for Hardanger, but decided that I didn't want to stitch forever because it was treating each square as a pixel. Oh. And... Whoa. making a design that way. And I decided that was more trouble than it was worth. <laughs> <laughs> so then d does design come out of this effort or is your designing a, a separate parallel path? Um, pretty much in the SCA and in uh, my time up before the SCA, um, the impetus has always been to uh, look around, draw something, and stitch that or draw that or whatever. And uh, in the SCA, there's a lot of emphasis on doing your own thing in the style of. Uh, so either you're reproducing something exactly or you're using it as inspiration for your own stuff. That's the creative part. And um, one of the things that... that people do a lot of in the SCA is, is if you have a fighter on the field, you give them a favor and to wear on their belt. So it's just a piece of cloth with something on it that says, hi, I support you. And um, usually it's got a, a, an object pictured on it. So in mine, I usually picture a dragon. Um, and then I would give it to my husband and he'd wear it on the field and eventually it would get all beat up. So I'd have to do a new one. Uh, in uh, the early 2000s, 
I read a story in Fine Lines, an article by Leon Conrad. And he talked about how he figured out the um, plaited braid on an existing article. Now, this was a mind blowing in two ways for me. One was, oh, I understand it. Now I can do it. Yay. And the second one is, oh, here is a way to look at items, embroidered items, and figure out what's going on. Oh, that's a rabbit hole. I'm going to jump right down, <laughs> feet first. So, so thanks to that. Um, and backing up slightly, um, in 1999, I was asked to pilot a new program for ANG called Master Needle Artist. And I thought, oh, sweet bags. Those are really cool. I like Elizabethan sweet bags. I'm going to do that. And then the guidelines came out, no Elizabethan embroidery. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. Oh, so, that's too bad. So I, I switched entirely and said, okay, I will combine quilts and Pictish art and cruel work. Okay, I'm doing that for Master Needle Artist. Um, but the sweet bags, of course, I'd already started down that rabbit hole. And so I was already researching it. And I thought, you know, this way I'm not doing their version of what I should be looking at and doing. I'll do my version of what I should be looking at and doing. So I started researching sweet bags, everyone I could find. Um, Lynn Skinner led a needlework tour of um, uh, England in about 2002, three, something. I'm not sure where or when and how it relates to that. Oh, well, never mind. The, but but before, uh, so, before, you, before you do that, before you do that, for those yeah. who don't know, what is a sweet bag? Ah. Okay, a sweet bag is a small pouch that's just slightly wider, usually, than it is tall. And if it's five inches tall, that's a really big one. Okay. Uh, and it's embroidered on both sides, usually entirely covered with embroidery. Um, and it's got three tassels at the bottom. It's square. It's got three tassels at the bottom. It's got finger loop braided uh, strings that allow you to close it and it's got two little uh, fancy things that I call openers at the edge of each side so that you can open it after you've closed it um, and it has all sorts of really cool stuff on them so when Lynn Skinner had this thing I signed up and then I said okay and I'm gonna see if maybe I can get behind the scenes at the V&A mm. and their sweet bags. And I did. And I took another member of the group with me and we had a blast. <laughs> took lots of pictures. Had to stop. My first reaction on seeing something close up, nothing between me and it but air, is to just stare and go, Gah. <laughs> <laughs> That doesn't help, and the drool can't go that far. Right. <laughs> so I need a second person with me to say, so what do you see here? Oh, yes, and <laughs> take pictures and um, take notes and so on. So it really helps to have a second person there because uh -huh. otherwise I am just uh, in awe of this 400-year-old thing that someone spent months working on yeah people talk about the vna i mean with such reverence that must be an amazing place oh it is <laughs> it is it is Here, let, me, let me say times. that must be an amazing place <laughs> <laughs> it, it is gary one of these days you'll have to go oh you've been yes oh and i didn't go behind the scenes i just toured the rooms and i could have lived there it was fabulous. Yeah, they used to have a uh, room upstairs. It was just their needlework cabinets. Oh, 
I first went there in 1988 when we were on the, the England tour as performers and we had a day off and we were taking those out and looking at them and t taking pictures and, oh, it was just ah, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> uh. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and when I found out you could go behind the scenes, if you ask nicely and, and, you know, are, are polite and, and, and they have time and room and stuff, you know, there's, there's many things. So for instance, right. the latest place I asked about, we're going, um, no, thanks to COVID, we aren't open. Go, oh. <laughs> right. I know. Yeah. Now, is that when you go behind the scenes, is that uh, fully supervised, full white glove? It is definitely fully supervised. Um, I do not get to touch the items usually. Okay. Um, and usually, sometimes there it is fully supervised. At the v &A, it certainly was. Um, but, for instance, at the Norwich Embroidery Center, um, they pulled out everything we asked for, put it on the table. Uh, they were within, uh, uh, often, uh, many of them were within uh, uh, plastic uh, so that no one could actually touch them. But not all of them. Yeah. Um, and then the two of us were left to pursue our dream. <laughs> Okay, so, yeah, so so you so you're able to sit there and take pictures and get up close and study and really evaluate how the needlework was done. Then, well, at that point when I'm actually confronted with something sitting there, I have a whole museum kit that I take with me. Um, and the first time I went behind the scenes, it was in Nottingham, and I didn't know what I was getting in for. They had a wealth of things, and I just asked to see everything they had for 16th century. There was not enough time. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they were very kind. And um, this was uh, uh, – and, and the rest of my party had gone on to London, and I, this was before cell phones. So it was kind of, okay, I'll meet you at, at this train station in London when I'm done. At this time, and you know, I'll take the X train out, and because so they left in the morning, and I left in the afternoon, and we met. But in the meantime, I had spent the morning with the curator and uh, his assistants, and some of the most amazing stuff I've ever seen. And more fool I, did I ask to take pictures? No. Oh. So I just took notes. Oh. Oh, oh. I, had, I had no rulers. I didn't. I did. So after that, I figured out that one, you should ask if you can take pictures. Two, you should have a kit to go with you. And in that kit should be a ruler <laughs> <laughs> and a pencil and paper. Um, and I, I added a few more things over the years, such as uh, a color reference. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, then I added a threads reference. I did a um, uh, a sampler of threads uh, for all of the different weights of blackwork thread that I had handy. And I take that with me, and so I can say, ah, the thread on this, even if it's silk, is about equal to, um, you know, uh, one strand of DMC floss. Yeah. Or I could say, it's really the size of Floche, or, you know, whatever. And so uh, and then I said, ah, I have lots of different gold threads. Let's make a sampler of gold threads, too. Uh -huh. uh, right. And so I've got that that I bring with and say, hmm. And admittedly, I'm not using calipers to me measure. I'm using by eye and taking pictures. Right. But does give me some sense of how fine some of the things they were working really was. Yeah. So if so if I have a chance to do that kind of thing, go behind the scenes, it sounds to me like if I just go in to see the world, I, I'm almost wasting my time that I should do yes. research ahead of time and say and, and narrow down to what I what I'm really interested Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Um, I, I want to get back to Nottingham with all of my stuff and have several days <laughs> <laughs> until they throw me out. <laughs> right, right. But, uh, which, uh, which they will do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I found that in England, um, if you give them a heads up far enough uh, ahead of time and an idea of what you're looking for and looking at, um, they are uh, happy to make it possible if they can. I mean, I absolutely understand if, if no one's there to, to babysit me, then no one's there to babysit me. And so, yeah, you know, that's that's fine. But I asked and, and I that's when I discovered that if you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah, yeah. I got to believe that for those curators there's a real sense of pride and ownership in the collections that you need to be sensitive to? Oh, absolutely. Um, but what I uh, learned uh, going behind the scenes at the L.A. County Museum of Art, that um, the curator of the collection is a curator of vastly more than just my little piece of it. Right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so... I may say, oh, look, that's a buttonhole stitch. They may be taking notes. <laughs> oh, okay. And what I do generally after I've been to a collection, uh, I didn't do this at first because I didn't think of it, um, but I'm kind of catching up on some now, um, is send the curator with my thank you note, a, and this is what I observed. Hmm. And um, that opened the doors to LACMA for me because I had a half hour with a group seeing about five things um, at a uh, conference uh, we uh, created through the SCA uh, for Northern California and Southern California people. And uh, a f one member of our, our group was on the board, uh, one of the review boards in LACMA. And she said, well, I think I can get us behind the scenes to see, like, some stuff. And we said, yes. And they said, okay, we've got room for uh, five people at a time, maybe seven in this little place, and we can show you seven things. Mm. And she's for one hour. And so we came back and said, could we have half an hour with seven people per? <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. And we did. Uh, and that, so then I wrote up what I had seen, sent it back to the curator with my thank you note. And she said, when can we have you back? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> nice. Nice. So, um, uh, it, it was lovely. Now, usually when you go behind the scenes, you're not, you can take all the pictures you want for your own purposes, but if you want to publish them, that's a separate, uh, deal. Yeah. And I'm, uh, currently going through some uh, hoops. I just went through those hoops for uh, some from the MFA Boston, and I've got those uh, observations posted to academia. Mm -hmm. so, so so, the overall message, if you, if you get to do this kind of thing, is don't charge in their American style. Uh, use some discretion, plan ahead, absolutely. communicate, share. You have summarized it beautifully. Okay. Yay, me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, of course, we're going to run out of time. So let's talk about what you're doing these days. Because now Beth's group is working or going to work on uh, one of your designs. Which one is that, Beth? More than a rose. We're yeah. signing up through the lightning round through EGA. Oh, good. And, good, good. And lots of discussions going around and about in the group. They were pretty excited. Um, it, Delighted to hear that. I had a couple of people say, oh, it's intermediate. And then they looked at it and I said, it's, it's 10 stitch and making your own decisions. We will hold your hand if that's the only thing you don't know how to do. We can, right. we can help you. <laughs> right. That's, that's basically it. Um, More Than a Rose is a group correspondence course based on uh, a sweet bag idea. That is, it's half the height and exactly the width of a sweet bag. And it's only one side. Um, but the idea is... 
these are things that are stitches that were found on sweet bags. And um, I do teach plaited braid because I think it's kind of the ne plus ultra of Elizabethan embroidery. And so you gotta, uh, you gotta learn it. You really do. But I try to make it easier to learn by uh, breaking it down into first learn where the thread goes and learn it on something really big, like say seven count uh, plastic canvas. Mm -hmm. I want you to know where that thread's going. And once you've figured that out, then you can try doing it at size with the uh, uh, metal thread or first with uh, pearl cotton, if you like. But pearl cotton um, is a very limp thread. And the metal thread has a mind of its own and you must tame it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Because I took um, Catherine Jordan had a sweet bag in, in, in an AGA magazine ages ago. And we did that as a, several of us did that as a group. Uh-huh. And I remember that gold thread. I think we were just doing chain stitch with it. I don't think we were, I know we didn't do plated. That's what's interesting, interested a lot of our group. They're like, we don't know how to do this one stitch. We've got to take this class. <laughs> well, and I had a lot of different varieties of Ceylon stitch in there too. Because Ceylon stitch, if you've got it, uh, with a very short rung, it looks almost like plaited braid. So if you have a situation where you're wanting plaited braid and it just doesn't make sense to you, only experts will notice the difference between plaited braid and a close together Ceylon. Okay, now that's another stitch. I don't know, maybe the other ladies do. So that'll be that'll be very exciting to, to I, learn. I think you'll find it's a lot easier. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> There's your out, Beth, right there. There's your out. Yeah, yeah. There's my out. There's my out. Yep. And, and we did talk about doing the sweet bag, and I can't. I don't. I don't remember the name of that one. It's um. Oh. The, the what? The, don't you have a sweet bag for the group course? Sweet bag, yes. Course? That's that's the other group correspondence course. And that one is at size, both sides, and has an ungodly amount of stitching on it. It took me four years. Oh. Okay. <laughs> but it's in the, exactly the right style, and um, it it's uh, probably got more things in the more than a rose, more techniques than uh, the sweet bag does. But the sweet bag takes a lot of effort, and there's information in there on how to assemble it. Mm. And so making the bits and pieces are needed to assemble it, the different kinds of, of uh, uh, tassels and even as a special extra credit, a Turk's head knot. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? So now right. what what is life like today? Is it designing and teaching? Are you doing it uh, uh, three-quarter time? Um, what? Well, these days, um, given the pandemic... Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought the only reason I hadn't updated my website was because I didn't have enough time. I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I had plenty of time and still didn't do that. Um, but uh, uh, I've been designing stuff. Um, I'm, in fact, uh, putting together various things that I'm teaching next year. Uh, I'll be at Greater Pacific Region uh, Seminar next year, at, also at the New York uh, national seminar, uh, teaching a couple, uh, Elizabethan classes, um, and some, uh, uh, zoom calls to, uh, do chapter programs, um, and in all sorts of fun things. Yeah. Uh, have you found it fairly easy to adapt to the zoom format or still a little bit of a battle? Well, of course, technology is <laughs> technology is my bailiwick, and I still yes. have problems, as you've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, but I'm also not afraid to just say, okay, let's try this, let's try this, let's try this, let's try this, let's unplug it and plug it back in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> turn it off and turn it back on. Yep. yep. <laughs> so, uh, so Zoom, and I've got a, a separate camera for zooming the close up of how you do the stitches. So yeah. uh, that helps. Yeah, there's there's a boom business right there. Cameras for that kind of thing. That um, yeah, somebody's made a lot of money in the last couple of years <laughs> just on those. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Now, do you, you know, discussions we've had recently? Uh, I assume that you see uh, online uh, courses as part of your future, just as an ongoing normalcy. I like to be able to say, "Hey, here's a cool idea. I'd love to share it with people." And by the way. They're making it worth my while to share it with them so that I don't get too, too distracted going off doing something else because mm -hmm. I am a person of rabbit holes. <laughs> no, well, and that's what uh, what makes you so fascinating. Yeah, I mean, look at all the things we've covered just in the past hour. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, no boredom in your camp. Mm -mm. Uh, no. Well, Melinda, this has been a treat. Thanks so much for making the time. Really have enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so and, and thanks to everybody for listening.